You're listening to the Better for America podcast presented by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. Hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca Weber. This is your AMAC podcast, Better for America. And today we have with us someone who brings enormous expertise to the table. He is a distinguished physician and widely recognized heart surgeon. He is a 10-year naval reservist and most recently, for the past 10 years, a leader in the U.S. Congress. And we're talking about Congressman Bouchon. He has represented Indiana since 2010. He grew up in a small Illinois town and has brought his lifetime of values to leadership in Congress, including on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And this is a time really when our nation faces an array of challenges from COVID and supply chain delays to energy related inflation and foreign challenges. And so I am really excited to have with us a real expert today. We welcome you, Congressman Larry Bouchon from the 8th District of Indiana. You're a true friend of AMAC. Thank you for being with me today. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Congressman, we have so many topics that we could discuss, and you have such a valuable vantage point on them all. But let me begin, if I could, with a very broad question. You have been in Congress for more than a decade, and in that time, a great deal has changed. We see a Democrat-controlled House and Senate that have taken the nation so far to the left, or at least they're trying to, and we have seen Obama's high spending, over-regulation, weak foreign policy. That was followed by Trump's strong economy, border protection, and foreign defense policy. And now we're seeing Biden is continuing policy failures from the energy sector to inflationary overspending, failed Mm -hmm. uh, border policy. So my question to you is, as you look back on your 10 years in Congress, do you think that the institution is being well-led? And does current House leadership, which has even talked of packing the Supreme Court, uh, respect the other constitutional branches? And is Congress becoming less accountable to the American people? Let's start there, sir. Yeah, I think, you know, ultimately in the House, I would say, you know, we're pretty accountable to the people we represent. I mean, I think you're going to see that coming in 2022, because I think you're going to see a dramatic shift in the leadership in the House. It's pretty clear that the Democrats in the House have taken the country in the wrong direction. Uh, And with the White House and its poor leadership, as you have outlined, on the economy, on energy, on the border, uh, and with massive inflation that we have, I think you'll see the accountability come into play in 2022. But uh, I do think, you know, that we need to get back to uh, the legislative branch really being uh, more prominent. I mean, we've seen the executive branch expand their role really over the last 30, 40 years to where, you know, when Congress can't do something well, as President Obama said, I have a pen and a, and a pad, and I can just do it from the, the Oval Office. I don't think that's good for the United States. And I do think, to your point, that um, the Congress itself needs to get some more uh, of a role here than we've had historically in the last 30, 40 years. And that's where the problem lies, because we're the most accountable to the American people every two years in the House. Uh, but if we're not doing anything, Uh, and we allow executive branch, uh, executive orders to carry the day, then I think that's bad for our country. Well, thank you for that. That makes a lot of common sense to me. I do want to ask you a few questions in policy areas where you are an expert. Maybe you can offer some insight to our membership. Uh, And that is in the area of energy. Now, the Biden administration seems to be taking us backwards. They have reversed the energy independence of the Trump administration They shut down the Keystone Pipeline, which AMAC members were against. And frankly, I think that they really triggered what's becoming an unmitigated disaster at the pump. And for those trying to afford winter heating, they really have created uh, an accelerated inflation, dependence on foreign, foreign oil and real energy insecurity at home. So how did this happen? Why did this happen? And what do we need to do to reverse the rising costs of energy? Yeah, the first let me say, you know, under a Republican House, we were able to allow export of American oil for the first time in, in decades. Um, and uh, under a Republican House, even though we had a Democrat president under President Obama when that happened, you know, we've become energy independent. And under the Trump administration, they continued that pathway. What the current administration has done, uh, some of the things you've outlined, is taken us backwards. I mean, America's biggest strength is our our natural resources, our 
our energy independence, um, and our ability to control our own destiny. And so blocking pipelines, stopping new permits on public lands to uh, drill for oil, and then ironically asking OPEC to import more oil into America has put us in a place where we're again dependent on foreign countries uh, to uh, control our energy costs in this country. And then their very, very overly aggressive climate agenda, uh, which, you know, we all, even as Republicans, recognize we want to move towards less emissions. We don't disagree with that. But when you try to shut down the fossil fuel industry overnight, it damages the economy. It results in this type of price increases, and it's only going to get worse. So I think they're taking the country in the wrong direction. My district is a very uh, energy in de very energy dependent. A lot of coal, a lot of natural gas, a lot of oil, um, and so is the Midwest. So you're spot on. The, this administration's taking the country in the wrong direction, and it's going to lead to uh, higher prices, not only at the pump, but when you go to pay your electrical bills, when uh, and uh, people just aren't going to be able to afford it. Seniors on a fixed income, low-income Americans are the ones who are going to be hurt the worst. And I think that once this impacts Americans' pocketbooks, you personally, and you feel it personally at home, and you feel the crunch, you understand that rising costs are affecting those people making well of under $400,000 a year. It is waking America up to say, hey, who are we electing into office? So I do hope and pray that 2022 brings with it a red wave. Uh, we need some more common sense. Uh, we need to put America first. I want to thank you for your insights. And, sir, uh, Congressman, you are also a distinguished medical physician, your heart surgeon, mm -hmm. and someone with really a comprehensive understanding of our health care system in the United States. States. Uh, my father, who's passed away two years ago, would always say to me that, Rebecca, he'd say, here in the United States, we have the best medical system in the world. Uh, and he watched what was happening as government grew more and more powerful and started to insert themselves really in the doctor-patient relationship. Our members are interested and concerned about the future of health care in America. So I want to ask you about COVID and the information that we're hearing about COVID. Um, these are really important questions and so many questions that have been rippling, uh, so mm -hmm. many that our older Americans have. Can we get, before I shift to COVID, first off, the, the, the price of prescription drugs uh, very, it keeps soaring. The overall cost uh, of Medicare, uh, medi medical uh, prescription drugs, AMAC is always looking to drive down those costs. How do we do that? Let me start there because a lot of folks listening, they're taking their prescriptions and they're seeing the cost for these prescription drugs increase. What can we do to lower the cost of prescription drugs here in America? Well, there's a number of things that we, we can do. One of the things is we have to get rid of the anti-competitive practices that are occurring in the industry. It's a it's a long supply chain there with a lot of middle people. And so you have some anti-competitive practices where people like pharmacy benefit managers, insurance plans, and others, their incentives aren't aligned to get the cost down because their incentives are aligned to make money. And there's no transparency there, so the American people can't see where that money is going. So you have misaligned incentives. Um, you have a supply chain problem all the way from the manufacturer to the pharmacy. Uh, and it's a very difficult problem to solve. But I can tell you the one thing you can do is make sure that there's uh, uh, no anti-competitive practice. For example, let me give you one example. There have been some uh, pharmaceutical companies, not many, that have actually paid um, generic companies not to bring their generic product on the market for a period of time. So what that does is it, it's an anti-competitive thing. So if you have a, a drug that's not a generic and the generic maker has been paid not to bring their generic to the market for, say, five years, guess where there's no competition, so the price doesn't go down. That's just one example. And we have bipartisan support for those type of things. Uh, pharmacy benefit managers uh, that manage the negotiations between the insurance plans and the pharmacies um, are pushing up the price of prescription drugs because they're paid by the biggest rebate they can get, the difference between what is actually paid and how much the pharmacy pays for the drug. That pushes up the cost, and it's anti-competitive. I know what will not fix it, the federal government taking over the pharmaceutical industry, which is being proposed by the Democrats in Congress, 
to, to price fix drugs in America. And if you do that, what will happen is you'll lose access. So you have to balance price and access. Other countries in the world that price fix, they have half the, the drugs on the market roughly that we do here and they don't get the new drugs as quickly. So it's a complicated problem that can be fixed, um, but we need bipartisan cooperation. And right now we don't have that. Yeah, it's tough, but I'm glad to hear that you've got some real good common sense solutions. And I know we as we're living through this continuing saga of COVID variants, what is your take on the seriousness of the Omicron variant? And how is this administration mm -hmm. handling this crisis? Uh, we heard, uh, you know, President Joe Biden say over and over again that he's going to shut down the virus, but it seems everywhere yep. I'm turning, someone has Omicron and it doesn't seem to be as bad or as deadly as uh, some thought it might be. Are federal mandates yep. the right answer or should these decisions be left to the states? Yeah, let me just let me just put on my medical hat here and talk you know, just from a medical standpoint. It's pretty clear that Omicron spreads more rapidly, but is less dangerous dangerous than previous um, versions of the virus. People are, are not getting a, as sick. Not as many people are dying from Omicron as they did, for example, from Delta or the original variant. So that's a good thing. But it's a mistake to say from a politician standpoint that you're going to shut down the virus. You're going to eliminate the virus. You're not going to do that. Because it's a, a virus that's all over the world. It's just like the measles was back in the day and still is in some countries. So what you have to do is you have to help people understand that the only way to really get control of this is to be immune. And there's two ways to be immune. You can either get the virus, like uh, the Omicron, and have natural immunity, which, by the way, we're not testing for, which we should be. Or you can get vaccinated if you choose to do so. And that should be left up to you your do and your doctor. It's a medical decision. Look, as a doctor, I think the vaccines are safe and effective. I've been vaccinated. I would hope people would choose to be vaccinated. But mandates are not the way to go. The federal government has no business mandating the private sector uh, to force people to take a medical therapy in this country um, that they don't want. Um, again, I wish people would voluntarily get vaccinated. I think the vaccines are the way to get us out of this. But I'm adamantly against federal mandates for the private sector businesses and their contractors. So um, we'll see where the Supreme Court goes. That's being discussed as we speak uh, today um, at the Supreme Court, uh, whether the mandates are constitutional or not. So I think going forward, I think we'll get out of the pandemic one of the things we need is more consistent messaging from the CDC. They're just all over the place. I mean, I've never, for example, this past week, I heard the CDC say, well, we're getting pushback on one of the things that we said, so we're going to consider changing it. Well, they're the authorities in medicine. They shouldn't be going by political pressure, right? They should be going by what the medical facts are and putting out consistent, accurate information to the American people. And they haven't been doing that. And that's confused a lot of people. So we need that from our government. We need consistency. We need to stick with the medical facts. Uh, and we need to not try to mandate that the American people do things that they don't want. We have to give them information and encourage people, but not mandate them. Yeah, we here at AMAC agree with you entirely with that statement. And of course, we do think that the vaccines are good and, and certainly important, but it is a decision between you individually and your doctor. And uh, we do agree that selling fear, it seems that the government is doing, uh, the administration anyway, is trying to sell fear, uh, letting people know it's going to be a dark winter of death, which is really not the right way to go about it. I think more people no. would be open to a vaccine uh, through in positive words of affirmation, encouragement, um, doing the right thing, but really leaving that decision between the individual patient and the doctor. Thank you for helping yeah. us understand what's really happening. Sure. Uh, I do want to pivot to another topic, one that I think that you have unusual insight into. As a Naval Reserve officer for 10 years, we really seem to be looking not only inward but outward with less confidence than we had a few years ago because we're watching uh, these actions of China, Russia, Iran, and even smaller states, which really seem to be nibbling away at our national security. And in some yes. cases, even preparing to almost like gobble up American allies and, and, and 
free people who deserve our protection. Uh, our national security seems in a few short months very much at risk. Are we watching the rise of new and dangerous threats, uh, an abdication of leadership by the Biden administration? When you look at Afghanistan, for example, look at China and how they're responding. What do you think 22, uh, 2022 will bring? And is American national security and the security of our allies at growing risk? Well, first of all, to your last statement, I think it is at, grow at a growing risk. And let me go back to Ronald Reagan, peace through strength. Uh, what people understand out there, our adversaries understand, is a strong America that supports its allies and is willing to step into the fray to protect freedom and liberty around the world. And so what you're seeing from the current administration is not unexpected because President Obama was like this. President Carter was like this mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Uh, President Clinton, but not as much, honestly, with the Balkans, President Clinton finally stepped up. Um, but you see this, it's a more of a pacifist type approach um, to a foreign policy. Remember, President Obama came in and said, well, he's going to be nice to Ahmadinejad over there in Iran and talk to him and get him to understand that he doesn't need a nuclear weapon. Well, Ahmadinejad came out right after that and said death to America, you know, and basically, you know, uh, gave us the you know what. So peace through strength. And this administration is not doing that. And I'm a little worried because you have Putin over there in the Ukraine. You have the Chinese doing what they're doing really around the world. Um, and we need to show American strength and that the Americans will stand up for our allies and defend liberty and freedom. And we're not doing that. And I'm concerned about it. But honestly, I think that it, it will turn around because you'll see uh, more and more criticism of this administration. And the American people aren't stupid. They understand that America needs to step up and be a force around the world for the most part. Most of the American people understand that. Um, so we'll see. I hope we can get through the next, you know, three years before we get a Republican president. Um, That's right. But I do think, but I do think this administration is, has a feckless foreign policy. It's, it's pacifism. Um, and I'm concerned. Yeah, we are concerned as well, and we appreciate you reflecting. Uh, we do need real leadership from the White House, so thank you for pointing that out. I think it's really interesting, too, when we see what's happening on the left, a lot of things are really backfiring. For example, uh, we see that the left has got this massive push for a federal takeover of our elections, uh, and AMAC is concerned. We recognize that there were so many things that were done uh, because of covid in the 2020 presidential election. Uh, and we understand that a lot of what was done uh, increases the chances of, of voter fraud, does not reduce the likelihood of fraud. Things like mail-in ballots, no voter uh, verification, uh, ballot harvesting, and these kinds of practices. Um, so I think, Congressman, I'd like your opinion on this, but I believe that when it comes closer to the 2022 midterms, that people, as you've indicated, are smart. Americans are smart. And the majority of Americans want uh, to know that our elections are free and fair. They're for yep. signature verification. Do you think this will come to bite the Democrats uh, in the rear when, in fact, uh, they're running in 2022 and they've got a, they see that um, Republican leadership sort of uh, draws explains to the American people that, hey, these are people that are looking to take all the integrity out of our elections. What do you think? Do you think that's a bad misstep on this on the part of the left to try to push uh, this massive federal takeover of our elections? Yeah, I think it is. I, it, first of all, let me just say, it's a completely false narrative that they have that what Republicans and, honestly, certain states are doing with their election law is meant to suppress the vote. In fact, it's just the opposite. Do you know in the last election there were more minority voters really voting than basically any time in history? And that's a good thing. We want everybody to vote. But what the Democrats are trying to do, for example, specifically for Indiana, is they want to eliminate our voter ID law, which the people in the state of Indiana love and they understand that you should have to show your ID to vote. You have to show your ID to rent a hotel room, to rent a car, to do anything. Ironically, to get yourself into a public building in the federal government. Right. I mean, you can't do anything without an ID. 
And the reason they want to do that, it has nothing to do with voter access. It just has to do with the fact that there's a higher percentage of their voters that, believe it or not, don't have a government issued ID. So what they should be pushing for is programs to get people uh, to get them a government issued ID. What we did in Indiana, it's free. You don't, all you have to do is go to the Department of Motor Vehicles. You, you show your birth certificate, you get a free ID, you pay nothing, and you can show that at the polls. The other thing they're doing is with this ballot harvesting thing. You know, it's one person, one vote. But do we really want political operatives, honestly, from both parties, going door to door and handing people ballots and forcing people to, to hand their ballot to them and then dropping them by the thousands into our electoral system? Do we really want that? No, we don't want that. In fact, it's not re Republicans uh, will do the same. But do we really want that? You know, that happened in California and we lost a bunch of seats. And then we did the same thing. We had to do, you know, play the game and then we won some back. But do we really want that? Uh, do we really want people to just mail in ballots in, in uh, without putting together really a solid program to make that happen? Look, Oregon has had mail-in ballots for a long time. It does work. But overnight, the federal government mandating that the states do this, uh, it leads to all kinds of problems. So the American people are on the side of safe and secure elections. 80% of people support voter ID, roughly. And the Democrats are making a big mistake, and I think ultimately it's going to come back at them uh, at the polls. I think so, too. I think it's a huge mistake. And people need to recognize, too, connect the dots when we have an administration that's got a wide open border that um, you, you have to ask yourself, is this intentional? Do they want these people coming over? Are they looking for those votes? Uh, how dangerous is COVID really when we estimate that perhaps 200,000 COVID positive people came across our southern border. And the Absolutely. southern border is of great interest to our AMAC members. AMAC was down there at the southern border. We spent time there at the southwest border. We wanted to see exactly what was going on. We wanted to meet with AMAC members to better understand how they were impacted, how everyday law-abiding, tax-paying American citizens are being impacted by this wide open border. And what we saw there was arresting. We saw a threat to domestic security, one that affects the whole nation, not just a border state issue. We saw human trafficking and a border so porous yep. that these drugs are pouring over. Uh, they're talking about over 200 million Americans could have died with the number of the amount of fentanyl that came across our border in yep. 2021. And there's this real sense of political indifference to the impact that this illegal border crossing is having uh, on our public health safety of our citizens. Uh, we're talking human trafficking, drug trafficking. We're talking COVID positive people. What is your view about the seriousness of this crisis and what should we be doing that we are not doing right now? Yeah, I mean, this situation is almost unbelievable because they, the administration really has an indifference to it. I mean, it, it's just a strange thing. You know, the vice president was tasked to go down there and she's she spent about 15 minutes down there in one of the major cities and has really not looked into the problem. Uh, I've been to the border twice in the last three years. I went in 18 and I was there last year in 21. And when I was there last year, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, first of all, let me address the COVID situation. They're not testing anybody. The only people that they test is if you're blatantly symptomatic like you have the flu or something, they test you. Everybody else that's coming into America, no COVID test. We have no idea what their status is. So as they push mandates for the private sector and the American people, they're not asking people coming across the border to be tested. And if you are tested positive, deporting you, not allowing you to come into the country at all. So that's one issue. The other, other issue is it's not just historical uh, norms of the type of people coming across. It used to be that you'd have Mexican citizens, mainly men of the working age, coming across looking for work. Now, if you talk to the border people, we've had people from over 150 some countries that, are, that have come across the border and been apprehended. Okay, let me say that again, over 150 some countries. We've had a number of people uh, on the terrorism watch list. We've had all kinds of felons that have been deported from America multiple, multiple times. Uh, we've had people bringing uh, little babies over saying it's their kid and it's not. And the same kid coming back and forth multiple times with different adults trying to say they're a family unit. We have 
an unbelievable number of unaccompanied minors. This is really tragic. We were in a, a facility in Doma, Texas that had these unaccompanied minors. Uh, there was a building that was supposed to have 350 children there and had 4,000 the day we were there. None COVID tested, packed in there like sardines in a can. It's a humanitarian crisis. Can you imagine if you had a child and you just sent them to a foreign country, they don't speak the language, they're six or eight years old, uh, and they're there by themselves, and you depend on uh, the good nature of that country uh, to uh, take care of them. Here's the fortunate thing for them. We're being, they're being taken care of by Americans, and we're compassionate people, and we're doing a tremendous job with the, that w down there on the border with the resources we have uh, under the conditions that, that our border people are tasked with. They're doing a, just a tremendous job, but let me tell you, they're worn out. Uh, they're overwhelmed, um, and I just don't understand the indifference of this administration. Do you have a sovereign country if you don't have a border that you can protect? The argument for that uh, is that you do not, and uh, that's where we are. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Last thing I'll say on this issue is the drugs. We just had a drug bust in Evansville, Indiana, a town of about 130,000 people. The amount of fentanyl found that came from Mexico, and we know this, we could kill 350,000 people. That's in a small town the size of Evansville. We're, ha we're having just an open border with fentanyl coming across the border, killing uh, really thousands and thousands of Americans. And the cartels are making millions of dollars on this. And honestly, Americans on our side are helping facilitate that and making millions, flooding our communities with fentanyl and killing our citizens. How, as a government, as an administration, can you turn the blind eye to that? I just don't understand it. Yeah, and the numbers don't lie. Numbers are facts. Numbers are truth. Numbers are real. People who are listening here should not be supporting anyone who supports Joe Biden's outlandish, no. insane policy as it relates to our southwest border. Uh, clearly, he's not putting America first. He's not putting America people first. And when you look at the foreign threats that we're seeing, and when you look at the porous border and you put these together, we should be putting more resources into our law enforcement. But what do we hear? What do we hear from the White House? What we're hearing from the White House is, well, no, we don't, we, we don't want to defund the police, but they say nothing when we see these reckless DAs that are saying, we're going to let everybody out on the street. We're not going to put people away for what they consider to be minor crimes, which are I mean, this would be unheard of years ago. We see what I oh live my. here in New York, Congressman. We're, you know, I can't go into New York City anymore. That's the, the real truth of the matter is, is that gone are the days where you'd like to go in, uh, let alone COVID. We know that that makes it difficult. But even if you take COVID out of it, the, the, um, the city is changing. New York is changing. And we can point directly uh, to these extreme liberal policies that are really ruining our nation. It seems these days, Congressman, that leaders, many of the leaders in Congress, want to spend money on countless things that Americans aren't interested in, uh, a consolidation of power at the federal level, and they underestimate the value uh, of the American people and their thoughts. <clears throat> it, 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 is a real, it is a real shame. What can be done to carry the message forward, uh, you know, that we need to do something here to reinforce peace peace here in America, safety at home. What, what, what should we be doing and what can Congress do? Can we, can we do anything more? Can we put more resources towards defense and crime, fighting crime? Absolutely, we can. Let me go back to the previous question, just say on the border, I forgot to mention, we need to con complete the physical barrier along the border, no doubt about it. The border control people say they can't fix this without it. We need to go back clearly to the state of Mexico plan under the Trump administration. Uh, we need more judges to adjudicate asylum cases. We need to change our asylum laws so they're not, they're not abused. All the things the Trump administration was doing. On the issue of the police, we absolutely need to go back to a, a strong support for our law enforcement in our cities. I mean, if you're in New York City, uh, can you imagine what the prosecutor came out and said the other day? I mean, when I read that all the laundry list of crimes, they're just not going to do anything about. One of them, for example, is resisting arrest. So when do you think uh, 
a criminal is going to be arrested by the police, they can just push the police down. They can run. They can do whatever. And they're not going to be put in jail for that. You know, imagine small crime, petty crimes. Imagine if somebody comes into your store, you're a local business owner in New York City. They just come in, steal a bunch of stuff, walk out and laugh because they know that the prosecutor, oh, that's just a petty, nonviolent crime. They're not going to do anything. I mean, it's just outrageous. You know, I've been a big supporter of law enforcement for decades, way before I was in Congress. You know, if you look back at the history of New York City, for example, and I have done that, what Giuliani and others did to clean up New York City, how did they do that? Uh, first of all, they got communities involved in their own neighborhoods. Uh, they put more police on the street corners. They they made sure that the city looked nice. They didn't allow uh, people to destroy their city. And they got buy-in from the communities. So what are we doing now? Well, the, the liberal politicians, people in these communities, uh, don't trust law enforcement. They don't cooperate with them. They don't have buy-in to help them understand that they need to be part of the solution of protecting their communities. Uh, it's just completely backwards. Um, and I, I tell you, I think that, again, the American people are going to put, finally push back. Uh, I'm optimistic about New York based on the new mayor. We'll see what his rhetoric uh, during the campaign about stronger law enforcement, uh, and whether that comes to fruition or not. Um, but we also have to stop this situation where we have George Soros supporting these candidates in, for prosecutors in all of these cities. That's one of the big problems, and you pointed that out. Um, the American people uh, understand this, um, and they're going to start kicking these people out of office. You know, if you poll the African-American community, 80% of them want more police on the street, not less. That's facts. That's numbers. As you said, numbers don't lie. This is, you know, it's a false narrative to say that that's not the case. You know, the only people that don't want more cops on the street are the criminals. That's so um, we, we've got to get, it's just foolish. Uh, it's not rocket science here. Um, and, you know, if people want to decrease the number of people in prisons, you know, we have to find the root cause of crime. We have to get back to getting people better educated, having people have more economic opportunity in their own neighborhoods, right? Rather than just government programs that throw, uh, you know, welfare money and food stamps That's and things right. about people that keep them trapped in their economic situation, keep them trapped in a community with no opportunity, with no educational opportunity. Uh, that's what we need to be doing. Yeah, I agree. More focus on the family. The family unit is so important. Right. That's where we ought to be investing. Uh, school choice as well. We've got to see our children back in schools. Yes. And we've got to make sure that the schools are putting our children first. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, these are all things important. and But not what we're hearing is, hey, we got to get every gun off the street and it's guns that kill people. It's people who kill people. And we ought to make yep. sure that we have our Second Amendment right intact because without that one, it, it's what protects uh, us against uh, tyranny and losing all of our other valuable rights. So uh, it sounds to me that you've got some really great ideas, some great common sense. We appreciate it. It's so, so uh, refreshing to speak with you, Congressman. I have one last question. Yes. And I'm sure you have strong views on this topic. But we do see more and more Democrats retiring in the House and the Senate. So what do you think the chances are that the Republicans retake one or both chambers? in 2020. Well, yeah, I mean, I think in, unless we make our own mistakes, it's pretty much inevitable. We're going to retake the House and the Senate's going to be close in fairness, but I think the Republicans will end up in the majority. Look, the politicians that are retiring, they see the writing on the wall, right? I mean, they don't want to be back in the minority. Um, you've got some committee chairmen, uh, you know, that are stepping down and retiring rather than staying in Congress. So I think the chances are excellent. But you know what we need to do as Republicans and as conservatives is we need to continue to get our message out to the American people about why these policies are the best direction to take the country. Um, we don't take you shouldn't take anything for granted. You know, it's on us to let the American people know here's what we stand for. Here's the traditional American values, family values, uh, freedom, liberty that we stand for and why it's better for America and make that case to the American people and not take this for granted. But I do think if we do that, we will take back the House and we will have the majority in the United States Senate in 22. Well, that is a wonderful message of hope. 
And that is our message out there. And for all of you listening today, it is a message of hope and courage, not fear. We see wonderful things happening in 2022, and AMAC will be paying close atten attention to the issues. Congressman, I want to thank you so much because your breadth and depth of understanding and willingness to speak up for AMAC members and all Americans on these topics is really so refreshing and invaluable. And as we move into the new year, uh, we want to let you know that AMAC members are grateful for your leadership. So thank you for taking time to share your perspective and your real experience with us today. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Wonderful. And to all of you listening, I want to thank you for tuning in. If you haven't downloaded the AMAC News app, you can watch, you can listen to this show, you can track breaking news right there on your smartphone. Please make sure to hit that subscribe button, like, follow, share wherever you are on social media. Until next time, everyone, I'm Rebecca Weber. This is your podcast, Better for America. Thank you for being here. God bless you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Better for America podcast. To learn more about AMAC and all it has to offer, visit us at www.amac.us.